Welcome, I'm Richard Ron, Principal with Leonardo Group Americas, and I'm here with Gerard Leone, also a Principal Hello. with the company, and this is our series, Survive and Thrive the Downturn, Using Lean Methods. And the topic of this module is raw material, as part of our topic of optimizing working capital. So let's give you a quick definition of what we mean by raw material, and then we'll talk, in, talk about how lean manufacturing may help you manage raw material better. Lean uh, raw material basically is the material we purchase from outside suppliers and we are not yet in the process of conversion so that material is being held in a warehouse or a stock room uh, waiting to actually begin work on it but that work hasn't actually started yet so this is our raw material. It's material we need to do work basically. As lean practitioners that is our favorite type of materials even though we don't want to have too much but it is our favorite type of material because it's the most flexible material. The the inventory we go after first is working process inventory, as we mentioned before, and we want to keep that raw material ready to be used on a moment's notice. Now, one of the warnings we have about raw material is we don't want too much, obviously, that's a working capital impact, but on the other side, we don't want too little, because I can guarantee a few days of shutting down the factory for lack of material, where you have an entire workforce of waiting for something to do, is a lot more expensive than having a little bit too much material. But of course our overall objective is not minimum raw material, it's optimum amount of raw material. That's what we'd like to achieve. Optimum meaning we have enough to do work, but not excess to that requirement. And sometimes getting in the way of having that optimum quantity of raw materials is the way in which we try to manage it today. For the last few years, for the last few decades, what we have tried to do in companies all over the world is to manage that using the famous MRP system. An MRP what it will try to do is to basically buy, buy on the basis of consumption and on the basis of a guess, the forecast. And what ends up happening there is that at times, most of the times, actually all the time, you will have too much of what you don't need and not enough of what you do need. And that causes problems of its own. So what we want to do is to try to stay away as much as possible from using MRP to buy materials. We are not making here an advertisement against um, against MRP systems. We do need them, however we do not want to run the factory with them. The issue here is with, with MRP or any kind of plan of that type is that we create a plan. It may be perfect for a few moments or even a few hours or days, but inevitably something changes. And then we have to change the plan and we have to recommunicate with suppliers and experience has shown that that's very difficult to do in an efficient way and that in fact uh, it's almost impossible to really tightly control raw materials using this kind of what we might call push methodology where we have a plan and we're trying to meet certain dates and certain quantities. Virtually impossible to tightly control raw material using that methodology. So what have we done? What can we do? What we have done with some of our clients is to go into some of the solutions we want to describe to you. Richard, what first? The, the buzzword we'd like to apply here is called pull versus push. So a pull system, as it relates to raw material, would very simple idea would mean that as we consume material, we have a signal that would then be communicated either manually or via fax or email or uh, in some electronic fashion back to an outside supplier to signal them to replenish what we already consumed. In that way, if we can set up that relationship, then as demand or mix of products changes in our factory, which it does on a daily basis, then the signal going back to our suppliers is automatically self-adjusting. In other words, if we don't use the material because something changed, even though we had an original plan to use it, if something changes, that signal then would either go sooner or later back to the supplier. Now this assumes a certain amount of control or smoothness in our production to be able to really get this to work efficiently, but really implementing pull systems with our suppliers is the direction we'd like to go for as, m as many components, as many purchase parts as we can. Not everything fits into that logic, but many of the components that we buy uh, can be put onto a pull signal with suppliers. Focusing on production smoothness is really important. Uh, if you are familiar with some of the, uh, the three M's, one of them, Mura, refers to uh, the need to have a smooth production system so you're not consuming in waves. Think about avoiding the tsunami. People, people that, uh, that speak to us and, and tell us that they've tried pull systems or Kanban systems in the past and it hasn't worked out well, one of the typical reasons it may not have worked out in the past, well, reason number one would be discipline. 
simply having procedures and policies in place to, to make sure this is working correctly. But the other reason is, as Gerard just mentioned, this idea of smoothness. Uh, if we're not controlling the smoothness of consumption to some level, then uh, we're going to have a hard time actually signaling back to suppliers and having the, expecting them to deliver on time when that is a continually moving target for them. A methodology we have developed and applied with some of our clients is this idea of uh, studying and working with the extended value stream. So Richard, a particular case about that, why don't you talk about uh, Liner and then I will talk about the benefits. Yeah, this is, uh, I like to share this case history. It's one of the easiest opportunities I've worked on in the past five or ten years uh, to achieve quick benefits. And that was we simply sat down with the purchasing department and we looked at the materials they were buying. This is a fairly large company, so they were buying in volume. And we analyzed each part number. We tried to restrict our analysis to those suppliers that were closer by, that weren't on the other side of the world. And we literally picked up the phone and called these uh, suppliers and talked about our desire to set up a pull relation, relationship. No one said no. E everyone was amenable. And in literally three days, we were able to reduce the overall inventory level by $3.6 million. I mean, I've, I've rarely seen anything that was so easy to do. <laughs> now, maybe that was unique, but uh, that was a, a great success, and it didn't take a lot of time. So what are we looking for in terms of benefits? First of all, an optimized raw materials inventory level. Remember, or notice, I'm not saying minimized, optimized to make sure that you can keep the operation going. Also, reduce or optimize working capital, um, working capital requirements. Uh, we also need to be looking into a, a reduced uh, requirement for floor space. That will happen the more um, uh, the, the better we have our inventories under control, the more, the less space we will need. And finally, the ability to automatically adjust the amount of inventory to our market requirements and to our factory needs. Yeah. Final reminder, this is something we don't do at first typically. Let's get our own four walls in order first before we spend too much time on raw material because we want to be able to pull that raw material into essentially a flow line. So we need to make sure that our priorities and the order in which we do things is correct. Absolutely. Don't do the old J-I-T. Jam it in trucks and send it back to the, <laughs> to the supplier. Do not do that. Thank you for your time. Okay.